They often say that an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I often say to people that a psalm a day keeps the devil at bay. For a long time now I've read a psalm every day. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant. The psalmist could never be accused of speaking about safe and irrelevant subjects as some of us modern preachers could be, perhaps. A young preacher who started his ministry in Kentucky, USA, preached his first sermon on the evils of smoking only to be informed by the deacons afterwards that uh, a third of his congregation were involved in growing tobacco. So the following week, he addressed the topic of drinking and was told afterwards that one third of the people were involved in the whiskey trade. The week after, he explained the dangers of horse betting and was told afterwards that his sermon had not been very well received because a third of the people bred horses, uh, thoroughbred horses. So finally getting the message, on the fourth week, his sermon uh, topic was the dangers inherent in deep sea fishing in international waters. (laughs) Now that's playing safe and being utterly irrelevant. Now the psalmist was a different kind of preacher altogether. Indeed, all the psalmists were were different kinds of preachers. When you take up the psalms and when you read them and when you listen to their message, then very often the subject matter strikes you straight in the solar plexus because it's so real and relevant to human experience. Take Psalm 73, for example. Here the psalmist very openly and honestly deals with the subject of doubt. Now every Christian will have doubts at some time or another. If anyone says that's not the case, then that person's uh, either being dishonest or that person is, is dense. There will always be occasions when we question our faith. The poet Tennyson once said, there's more faith and honest doubt than half the Christian creeds. And doubt is that which really only a believer can experience, as Job found out, and as I'm sure some people here have found out, and as the psalmist found out, indeed so severe and serious were his doubts that he was on the point of giving up his faith. But as for me, verse 2, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had well nigh slipped. For him, doubt was a serious problem, and it is a serious problem for many people. So let's look at it together from this psalm as we try and learn about the source of doubt, verses 1 to 14, and the solution to doubt. Verses 15 to 28. The source of doubt. Now, doubt, you see, can be traced back to its source. And its source, as we find here in the psalm, lies in the discrepancy between theory and fact. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, here's the theory. The theory says... God is good to his own. Or in words like that. Verse 1. Truly God is good to the upright, to those who are pure in heart. Now that's the theory. And that's a kind of instinctive rule that most people feel is right. God's good to his own. God's good to the good. But what about the facts? The facts of existence, the facts of experience, the facts of everyday life as witnessed by us in the world round about us and as reported on in the daily newspapers. Well, the facts seem to say precisely the opposite. Verse 3, I saw 
the prosperity of the wicked. See, there's the theory. There's the facts. And the discrepancy between them. And it does seem to be the case that the, the bad continue with their badness and get away with it. They seem to get away with murder, literally, at times. And God doesn't seem to do anything about it. Indeed, it seems to pay to be bad. It seems a waste of time to be good. There's a discrepancy between the theory and the facts. The theological theory and the facts of human experience. And it's the discrepancy that leads to doubt. It leads to us questioning faith and questioning God. Now look more closely at the facts concerning the wicked as set out in Psalm 73, the first half. I mean, it's so true to life. What we find here, we are told that the wicked enjoy great prosperity, as we've just found out in verse 3. Now we know all about bank robbers, don't we, who go to South America and live on their spoils and enjoy a luxurious lifestyle. Indeed, their spoils are added to often when they tell their story in the Sunday newspapers. The wicked enjoy great prosperity. And we are told here that the wicked experience few problems. Verses 4 and 5, For they have no pangs. They are not in trouble as other men are. They are not stricken like other men. Dictators and despots like Kim Sung in North Korea do enjoy years of good health, live to a ripe old age and die in their beds. We know this. They experience few problems. And then we are told here that the wicked display extravagant pride. Verses 6 to 9. Therefore pride is their necklace. Their eyes swell with fatness. They scoff and speak with malice. Malice. Dick Francis, in one of his thrillers, Driving Force, tells of his hero, Freddie Croft, who thinks that his adversary, the one who's against him, is driven by two forces, money and muscle. But he discovers there's a third driving force, and it's malice. And that was the most dangerous of all. And the wicked scoff with malice against goodness and against God. When blasphemous satire was all the rage on television uh, in the permissive 60s, I remember my mother used to say again and again, it's a wonder that God doesn't strike them down. But he doesn't. They get away with it. So the wicked enjoy great prosperity, they suffer few problems, they display excessive pride. Not only that, they have enormous popularity. Verse 10 and 11. Therefore the people turn and praise them and find no fault in them. Have you been following the case of O.J. Simpson in the United States of America just now? The famous American footballer and television newscaster, sports presenter who's been charged with the murder of his former wife and another person. The whole of America seems to be watching this this case. He was caught by the police in a dramatic chase on Los Angeles Freeway, watched live on television. I read a ten-page article about O.J., as he's called, on my way to Northern Ireland a month or so ago, and the most chilling thing that I found was the report that when he was charged and brought to the police station, there was a great crowd of demonstrators with banners We love you, O.J. The psalmist says the wicked enjoy great popularity. Behold, verse 12, here's the wicked. There they are. Always at ease. They increase in riches. These are the facts. But the question has to be asked, why is this now a crisis for faith? After all, there's always been a discrepancy between the theory of theology and the facts of experience. The wicked have always prospered and got on well. Why is this now a crisis for faith, for the psalmist? I think that's a very important question to ask. And the answer is found in verses 13 and 14. And we find there that the psalmist has become a sufferer. 
What does he say? All in vain I've kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I've been stricken and chastened every morning. You see, it's the personal pronouns that that tell us the real reason for his crisis of faith and the doubts that arise. He's become a sufferer. And this is true to life, isn't it? Suffering for most of us is an academic subject so often. Until we begin to suffer, suffer personally. That's when the doubts come in, isn't it? The writer Hazlitt said, The smallest pain in my little finger generates more mental concern than the destruction of thousands. Well, he's overstating the case, but you, you see the point, don't you? It is true. All day long I've been stricken. That's when doubts concerning God arise. It's a discrepancy between theory and fact in my personal experience. I suppose we've got to say that the psalmist is being honest enough to say that it's self-interest that promotes this crisis of faith for him at this time, at this point. We read daily of thousands of road accidents, but it's, it's only when it happens to somebody in our own circle we begin to doubt God. We know that millions contract cancer. But it's perhaps when someone in our own circle contracts it that we begin to question our faith we know that multitudes are unemployed but it's only when someone in our own family perhaps is on the dole queue for a long time that we begin to have serious misgivings about God's goodness isn't that the case whatever the motives it's a very real problem this 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 problem of doubt And you see, it sources the discrepancy between the theological theory and the facts of experience, personal experience. But what about the solution? Verses 15 to 28. Now notice where he found the solution. Where did he find it? Well, he found it in church, didn't he? Verses 16 and 17. When I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. He went to church and there he found his solution. Now, I don't know. He maybe went to church because he had to go to church. Perhaps he was an office bearer and he was on duty that day. We know that he was a singer, perhaps he was a singer in the choir and his voice was required that day. Perhaps he was even a preacher in the pulpit and he had to be there that day and give the message whatever reason it was in church that he found the solution. And so it's pretty vital to go to church, isn't it? Even when we don't feel like going to church. I'm afraid that many of our church members in our churches are ruled by their feelings in this matter, as in many matters if they feel like going to church they do if they don't they don't but God has never intended that we should be governed by our glands but ruled by his will why do we go to church well we go to church because God commands it and God knows that's the place where we'll find solutions solutions to things that are problems in our lives. And sometimes these solutions come very surprisingly. Sometimes a light surprises the Christian while he sings. It is the Lord that's risen with healing in his wings. So he found his solution in church. I went to the sanctuary. But what did he discover in church? Well, first of all, he discovered... As far as his doubts were concerned, concerning the prosperity of the wicked, he discovered that the future is of the greatest importance. I went to the sanctuary and then I perceived their end. Literally, that is, their afterwards. I went to church, says the psalmist, I went to church and sang the hymns and joined in the prayers and listened to the sermon. And there I realized once again there was an afterwards. 
I realize there was an afterwards for the wicked, which means ruin, verse 18, destruction, verse 19, and dismissal, verse 20. Just as one wakens up in the morning after a crazy dream and dismisses that dream, so says the psalmist, one day God is going to dismiss the wicked just like that. There's going to be an afterward for the wicked, and there's an afterwards, verse 25. 24 for the righteous and afterwards you will receive me into glory there's an afterwards there's a future now it's hard for us to remember this isn't it we tend to think that the things that are not seen are things that can be ignored but the things which are unseen are not imaginary. They're real. And we've got to try very hard to see through the things that, which are seen to get through to the things in the future which are unseen. John Wesley in his journals tells of one day he was walking with a companion who said to him, What do I do with my doubts? And Wesley said to him, Do you see that cow over there looking over the, the stone wall? Why do you think that cow is doing that? And the companion said, well, because the cow can't see through the wall. And Wesley said, precisely. Precisely, that's what we've got to do with our doubts. When we don't see through them, we've got to see over them to what lies ahead. We've got to see the end, the afterwards, the future. Sure, the wicked will prosper here and now, they will. But in a little while, says another psalm, the wicked will be no more. The future is important. The future counts. What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? We've got to take the future with the utmost seriousness. He discovered that the future is of the greatest importance. And the second thing he discovered was that faith was of the greatest value. Verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee, or on earth besides thee? In church he rediscovered that faith in God was his greatest good. Verse 22. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You can't really give up faith in God if you're a true believer. It's a bit like one of these white cork boards that you have in the swimming pool. You can uh, press down the cork boards and submerge it under the water for a time. But then when you let go, the cork board pops up again. And that's, that's like real faith. It's it's a supernatural assurance which God has given into the heart of a true believer who turns and trusts in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And though doubts may push the faith down and submerge it for a time, real faith will always resurface again. Because real faith knows ultimately that God is its greatest good the most precious relationship in life. What is the most precious human relationship in life? Well, we know what it is and we know how it's recognized in the vows that a newly married couple take at the church altar as they promise to have and to hold for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health. And what are they saying? Well, they're saying that their relationship is more precious than health or wealth. And if that's so in a human relationship, how much more in the divine relationship, the relationship with God? God is our chiefest good. And the true believer knows that deep down. Whatever the doubts are that assail him or her. Truly God is good to the upright. Is he? Is he? Well, it all depends what you mean by good. If we mean that God gives health and wealth always, then it's not true. God is not good to the upright. Sadly, that's what some people teach today in the Christian church. But he gives wealth and health. 
always. But if we mean by good that he is, verse 26, the strength of my heart and my portion forever, then it's true. It's true. And so, verse 28, it is good to be near to God. It is good to be close to God. So what's the message for us this morning? Well, I think we can say that it's not wrong to have doubts as believers. This psalm confirms this surely for us. It's not wrong to have doubts and to voice these doubts, to express these doubts, and even to tell God about these doubts in prayer. It's not wrong to question your faith. We mustn't run away from questioning one's faith. But we mustn't yield to these doubts. We must submit to faith, faith in God. And we do that as we meditate on the future and as we consider the friendship and the companionship of God. You see, it's not proof that we're needing it's not logical, rational, reasonable proof that we're needing. Test tube proof in a science laboratory. That's not the thing that we're needing. It's the presence of God that the human heart aches for. That's what we all long for. The, the reality of God, the experience of God, the sense of God, the knowledge of God firsthand. And that is what God offers in the sanctuary, in the church. That's what God offers in daily in daily life as we come to him in his word and in prayer. That's what this psalm is about. So may God bless his word to us and help us to cope with these doubts and to say with the psalmist, Whom have I in heaven but thee or on earth besides thee? May the Lord bless this word. Let us pray. Oh God, we do need your help. We do need the clarity of insight, the, the reality of your truth and presence to make its impact upon our souls, especially when we are afflicted with something we just cannot figure out. Something which doesn't seem to tie up with your truth or your goodness. We need to have this ability to trust you in the dark. Please help us to stay close to you and to walk with you, to walk in the light of your presence, to rejoice in your name all the day long and to exult in your righteousness. Hear us as we pray this. In Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.